Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Christensen and this is Horror 101 with Dr. AC, celebrating classic horror films throughout history with new episodes every Friday night. Tonight we're going to be celebrating a double feature, the 1939 and 1959 film adaptations of Arthur Conan Doyle's classic Sherlock Holmes story, The Hound of the Baskervilles. The former, featuring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce as Holmes and Watson, respectively, and the Hammer film production featuring Peter Cushing, Andre Morel, and Christopher Lee. Know then the legend of the Hound of the Baskervilles. Take heed, and beware the moor in those dark hours when evil is exalted, else you will surely meet the Hound of Hell, the Hound of the Baskervilles. Which way? For heaven's sake, which way? The greatest story ever written by one of the world's greatest storytellers, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's classic masterpiece of mystery, suspense, and horror, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Some revolting sacrificial rite has been performed. Depths a human being can sink to. What human being could have done this? That is precisely what I intend to find out. But how can you be so certain that somebody took one of the bishop's spiders and deliberately placed it in Sir Henry's room? That it wasn't in the luggage he brought from South Africa? Elementary, my dear Watson. There are no tarantulas in South Africa. What do you want me to do? Identify anything I may find. Strange things are to be found on the moor. Like this, for instance. Why? You thought it was going to be easy, didn't you? Didn't you? You won't be the first of your family who thought that. And you won't be the first to die because of it. The game's afoot, and there's no time to waste. We're going to be chatting about these two classic adaptations of the Arthur Conan Doyle thriller. And let's bring everybody in, and let's chat with Dave M. Gray. I'm Dave. Doug Long. Hello. Mike Mayo. Greetings. And after a long absence, Michael Weber returns. Hey, everybody. And we are going to be chatting about The Hound of the Baskervilles, 1939, celebrating its 85th anniversary and The Hound of the Baskervilles, 1959, celebrating its 65th anniversary. Thanks for coming on the show, everybody, and welcome. Usually we do our kind of origin stories as to where we came to the films for the first time. Uh, I'm going to kind of add to that and say, which one did you encounter for the first time, and when and where was that? For me, it was the 1939 version um, decades ago when I was a kid. And um, I was easily fooled by uh, a, something that's not in the book or any other film versions that I've seen, which is where Sherlock Holmes dresses up as the old man and reveals himself to be the great detective. Dave, how about you? Yeah, I think it's also the 39. TV, it was on TV all the time. Come from a long line of, of movie fanatics. So, Excellent. Uh, Michael? I came to, it, uh, to the 39 version first, but it was after watching the later uh, Universal versions. So when I came to Hound of the Baskervilles, the big question on my mind was, where did this budget come from? <laughs> <laughs> and Mike? Probably the, the 39 version too. And uh, But before I saw that, I had read The Hound of the Baskervilles and, and, and read a, an awful lot of, of, of Doyle. So I, I really uh, you know, kind of knew what it was going to be and was just intrigued by it. The Hammer version, I had not seen until we started talking about this. Oh, fantastic. I'm excited to hear your your response to it. I'm the outlier here because I came to the Cushing one first and then came back to, I had known about the uh, 39 version, but uh, it wasn't, it didn't play all the time on TV where I grew up. Uh, we actually got the, the Cushing one. Uh, let's go ahead and start off with the 1939 version, which was the first. Well, yeah, it was the first of the uh, 
um, Basil Rathbone uh, versions. And as you mentioned, uh, these first couple were at 20th Century Fox, and then it got booted over to Universal. Um, you know, you can, Michael mentioned the budget, you can see it in the all the fog, <laughs> you know, in London, in the Moors, uh, which really goes a long way in making the sound stages work uh, in that. Um, Basil Rathbone himself was one of the busiest actors of the time. Um, he was in six movies that year alone. Um, <laughs> he had been the villain in a lot of uh, movies before that and was known as the best swordsman in film, uh, which, which we saw the year before in um, The Adventures of Robin Hood, Technicolor over at Warner Brothers. So this was a chance for him to be, of course, not the villain. Be a more heroic character. Yeah. And yes, as you said, he, he went on to play the role, you know, 13 more times, plus uh, I think he appeared on television. Um, and it Radio. kind of came to identify him. Like he was, he couldn't escape uh, the Deerstalker after a while. Uh, it just kind of became who he was known for. Uh, Michael Weber, what was kind of like your first uh, reaction to it when you saw it? My first reaction was in some ways, I think the reaction that the director wanted you to have. And it's the way he stages Rathbone's reveal, which is in profile, in the robe, and, and in a manner that makes you immediately go, ah, you know, that th the the kismet of this man being alive and available <laughs> and interested <laughs> to dare take on this role that almost just seemed like an inevitability for him. And then that he was just so game to jump in and go, yeah, let's have fun with this. Uh, you know, I mean, to your point in terms of his staying with the series uh, so long, uh, you know, he was on radio as well doing it, but then also even did it on the Broadway stage. Mm. Um, so there wasn't any medium that he was not really like dominant in in this character. I think that that's the thing that struck me is you're just going, wow, how lucky we are that he was alive and said yes when they offered him the role. Yeah. Well, because he he does bear such a resemblance to the original illustrations that we saw. Um, I think that's that was kind of the uncanny yeah. quality of it. Yeah. Uh, Mike Mayo, how about you? What was your initial reaction? I, my initial reaction, you know, when I first saw it, I, I was really too young to kind of analyze it at all. But looking at it again, it's the voice. He's got that really great voice, and that's why it, it works so well on radio, too. The look, of course, is there, but just he sounds like Holmes, and he is able to deliver those lines in exactly the right way so that, you know, I just believed him as Holmes from the, the moment uh, we first saw him. And I really like that comment about the, the, the profile and everything in the robe. That's a really great intro to him. We'll talk more, I'm, I'm sure, as we go on about the difference between him and Cushing in the role. He will always be Sherlock Holmes to me. As much as I admire all of the others, most of the others, um, I, I, I really think he still will, will always be the Holmes to me. Great. And Dave, how about you? The first time I heard uh, Rathbone as Holmes was actually the, the radio show. Mm -hmm. uh, and I literally don't remember the first time I saw the movie. Uh, but for this one, the thing that really struck me, uh, especially because the Gillette film has been found after being lost, he is the perfect hybrid of the books and what Gillette did that everybody has copied since. It's, it is a, a really rare kind of performance. Expand upon the Gillette thing for well, folks who... Uh, William Gillette was an actor who decided to be the first to do Holmes as a stage play. But a lot of the things we think about Holmes, uh, it's elementary, my dear Watson, a lot of the mannerisms and things come from the play. And they just got picked up by Barrymore, picked him up, the, the Germans and, oh God, what, 1913, the, the original silent German, Hound of the Baskervilles in four parts, take things from that. Uh, Gillette played Holmes for 30, 40 years on stage. When you talk about Holmes, you talk about Doyle and Gillette. And a lot of folks don't really know Gillette. The film was thought lost until 2020, 2018, mm -hmm. something like that, until pretty recently. In looking at the various adaptations, I mean, the Germans did it four times. Germans did it a lot. Before the 1939 version. And there was also a British version that uh, came out a couple of years prior to this as well. As we've seen, it's one of the more popular, if not the most popular 
uh, Sherlock Holmes adaptation. It's been done at over 20 times. The pairing of Basil Rathbone, you know, you have to have a, a Watson to go with your Holmes. Uh, let's talk about Nigel Bruce in this series. I was actually, because he comes with so much baggage of being the buffoon, uh, but watching the original Hound of the Baskervilles, he's actually, there's much less of that. I think he gets more buffoonish as the series goes on, especially once we get into the universals. He's relatively subdued by comparison in this first version, Nigel Bruce as uh, Dr. Watson. I love him in the Fox films, but when Universal takes over, it's, oh, somebody hated that man. <laughs> they hated him so much. It's a traveling uh, pattern that happens with some of these characters. I, I, I think of also like Charlie Chan or, or some of these other that went on for long series and they began to get distorted. And especially when they switched studios, which also happened to Charlie Chan. It happened to the Bowery Boys and a number where, where the, the, the studios get cheaper, the details are not there, the research is not there. And so it begins to morph into other things. Um, but I think Nigel Bruce was also one of those actors who earlier in his career on film, that he was a much more sort of respectable character actor who then began to get defined by this kind of character. And so in later films, when he would show up, it always was that, you know, kind of fuddy-duddy British thing that he came up with that so many actors of the era, as he's the call or, or um, just any number of them, they would just cast to do that thing. I think that this was still earlier in his career when he still had the dignity and the interest to be a complex actor. And he, and he absolutely could. And, uh, and he probably, you know, hadn't really figured out what worked for him as the character. He's just right. trying to, he had the, the book to go off of. And of course, as Dave's pointing out, you know, the William Gillette uh, prototype, which everybody was referring back to. So that's probably what he was basing it on until he kind of took off in his own way. And uh, I think in some ways, you know, they did for Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, the risk of damage that almost like Adam West kind of did to Batman, where we needed to unpack it and go, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, Dr. Watson is not a buffoon. He's a pretty smart guy, you know. Once the, the series got started, he was kind of locked into this caricature and it, it just, they, they kept building on it. I mean, that, that happens with anything that becomes a series in a way that the, the stories that Doyle stories never were. I mean, much as I love Nigel Bruce, that is not the character that Conan Doyle created. Uh, and we'll go into this a lot more later, I'm sure. And like I said, because I discovered uh, the stories in the books first, I've always objected to him. And mm -hmm. just, that's, that's not the Watson that Holmes needs. He needs a guy who is standing next to him. He's ready to pull the pistol out of his pocket when needed. And somebody, uh, one of the commentary tracks on uh, this uh, for the 1939 version, they talk about how what plays on the page uh, doesn't necessarily work as well in a narrative film. Uh, you need to have a foil, you need to have some opposites so that you have tension to throw back and forth. As we see, you know, in later films where Watson has more dignity, has more intelligence, uh, is, if not his equal, certainly uh, a contemporary. It can be done, but I'm sure that audiences enjoyed that dynamic between the two. I definitely did enjoy that, even though, Mike, you're absolutely right, and I reread the book. He's not the the Watson from the book, but on film, he sure makes a nice balance for yep. uh, Holmes. We like Holmes a little better because Watson <laughs> likes yep. him. And he gets a couple of really good, you know, he gets to be kind of smart. Like he figures out the light out of, you know, in the moor. Yeah. Um, but then later he's not as obviously, he lets Stapleton run by him and didn't realize like Holmes did, that's our killer. And that is a really weak ending. Um, that <laughs> Sorry if I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> That's okay. That's so interesting about this story, and especially as it relates to film, and then you see it related in the advertising of this 1939 version, is that Holmes is absent from the story intentionally yeah. so long. 
Mm -hmm. and, and Watson really gets to be prominent for such a momentous a part of the beginning of the film. And then, but you see that reflected in, in some ways in the advertising where he wasn't leading with so much with Rathbone. It was, it was almost like pushing more the romant, a romantic story that they laid. You know, Richard Green gets first billing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, this is Rathbone's second go at doing a series detective he had oh. played philo vance 10 years earlier and it, it did terribly so i've always thought that was part of it because his i mean philo vance is impossible if you're not william powell but but him, he, him wanting to have another chance at doing something yeah, let's talk about richard green and let's just kind of talk about the story itself i mean uh, for those who aren't familiar the how the baskervilles follows uh, sir henry baskerville who is in recently inherited the baskerville estate after his elder brother in the novel and i think it's his uncle in yes. this yeah. story uh, dies of a heart attack or of fear out on the moors uh, and there's the legend of the hound of the baskervilles uh, which attacked and killed their ancestor hugo and so there is a whole uh, plot against henry baskerville as he returns to the estate and uh, a myriad uh, number of suspects and some really pretty enjoyable red herrings particularly i i definitely enjoy dr mortimer in the personage of uh, of uh, lionel atwill here, here, Lionel. <laughs> <laughs> Who later in the series plays Moriarty. Well, and we recently, I mean, earlier this year, we chatted about him because he and Rathbone were paired for Son of Frankenstein. Right, that same year. Same year. Yeah. We also see John Carradine shows up as Barry Mann, not Barry Moore. Right. Uh, our manservant. And, and particularly cadaverous. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, the beard, the goatee yeah. makes his long face even longer. But it does become just a, a wonderful kind of murderer's row. But as you said, it also does focus very much on the romance uh, between our character of Beryl Stapleton, who's played by Wendy Berry, and uh, Richard Green as Henry Baskerville. And it's done very nicely um, because there is no kind of subterfuge in terms of like her being uh, Stapleton's sister who's actually his wife or his daughter or you know whomever else she's just his stepsister and she's fair game i only i figured that must have been a production code you know requirement yeah. a married woman couldn't have an affair with the leading man ah yeah i hadn't actually thought yeah. about that you were making your, as it is uh yeah it is it is pretty chaste pretty sweet uh you were <laughs> you were shaking your head dave are you not a fan of the romance this film's cast is really strong I, I feel Wendy Berry is the one really weak note. That that's that's all. I and there's just too much of it for me. I just I, I want to hit them with like a hose and just have them go away. <laughs> you know, let Put them in the moors. Yeah, let Watson look for the the missing the 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 runaway killer in the moors, and I'm fine with that. But no, 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 don't make kissy faces. You guys are just uh. <laughs> Oh, no. Dave is our resident eight-year-old in the group. <laughs> I don't mind in others. It's just there's something about Wendy Berry in this that just makes me go, well, why is she, why is she she's so checked out? I think that's... It's a very 1930s Hollywood performance. Yeah. yeah. Well, and everybody else is so strong. I, I'm Well, I mean, you know, Mary Gordon's Mrs. Hudson isn't given much, but she's the only person... I, is she in all 14? Yeah. She's in most yeah. of them. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. she was on the radio, I believe, as well. Yeah, she was on the radio. The, the, and in terms of the story, the, she really should be more of a temptress um, mm. for, for the story to work, for, for him to fall for her right away. There's got to be a, a bit more, even by 1939 standards, a bit more heat there. And there's no <laughs> heat. You know, one of the things that strikes me about a, a film like this at this moment in 39 when, as we're mentioning, Son of Frankenstein comes back and, and the return of the horror cycle. And you see other studios when Warner Brothers was attempting to do Dr. X with with uh, the, the one with Bogart as, as yeah, the, the return of Dr. X. Return of Dr. Yeah. X, not, not yeah. Dr. X. But watching other studios uh, like attempt to get into the genre and it, that's, I think, the thing that strikes me, again, about this being 20th Century Fox is going, 
they just don't entirely know like what's the alchemy that they've got going over at Universal Studios mm -hmm. to be able to pull something like this off. Doug, what what would you describe as like in 39, what was 20th Century Fox like sort of known for? What was their kind of signature film if they were particularly good at something? Warner Brothers, you know, was the, the urban gangster thing right. and... and you know, what were they doing here? Well, they, they had Tyrone Power, you know, uh, Swashbucklers um, at the time. Alice Faye was kind of finishing up her musical career then, Donna Michi in some of those as well. And yeah. again, when you think of like musicals, you know, you're it's that 20th Century Fox versus MGM. Right. So, like they, Alice Faye is not like, you know, they had Cesar Romero and people like that. Yeah. You know, I and always- Sonia Henny. <laughs> yeah. But I guess it was, it was Zanuck was running this. So it was yeah. again, that sort yeah. of like social and prestige type pictures. And yeah. this almost just seems like maybe they were trying to go for the literary element. Oh, it's a great book or, or something. I mean, the production schedule was pretty tight. Like they were, they, they moved this out pretty, I think it premiered in uh, the end of March, 1939. They made the second one quick enough that they could get it out the same year. Uh, the Adventures of Sherlock yeah. Holmes. So it was. Did they know they were making both of them at the same time. Or I don't think so. I mean, I think it was one of those where they were waiting to see would this land, and it did. It was it was one of their biggest money makers for 20th Century Fox for the year. Um, but I think what you were talking about with the budget. I mean, I love those scenes out on the moors. Like, yeah. even though it's evident that it's on a stage, uh, the matte paintings are incredible and there's just such wonderful depth to all of it. Like you said, the fog, the atmosphere, and, and that dog is awesome. <laughs> well, and, and the other thing that's great about these versus the universals is that these are in period where right. universal, yeah. you know, brought them into the present and it's so mm -hmm. great to, you know, see them. And, yeah. and again, the details really show up. You feel they paid attention to it and it feels like it's in the right period. Well, and apparently it was the first time that it ever had been done in the Victorian period. All the previous. Now, Dave, Dave has been recently <laughs> laid up, literally. And so I know you went through a bunch of them, but uh, is that, is that? Watch most out? of them. I mean, the silent ones, I, I glossed over after a while. I was, I was on pain pills laying down like, oh, <laughs> so yeah. As I recall, just like the 59s, the first one actually filmed on the Moors in Dartmoor. And so, if the Moors don't work, the movie doesn't work. Yeah. So much of it happens, you know, mm -hmm. out there on on the moors. These are not typical horror films, and uh, they ultimately, you know, it turns out to be kind of a Scooby Doo ending. And that it the 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 hound is just a big dog. It's not a supernatural creature. But I think because it is discussed in that way, it it's kind of like an old dark house in that regard. And that. We think yeah. about, well, there is, there are ghosts, there are ghosts, and then when we find out there aren't, it's okay, because we've been playing them as though there were ghosts throughout. Here we're playing as though we've got a monster yes. that's out on the moors, and we never see the monster except like in little, you know, mm -hmm. uh, distant shots and things like that. Which always struck me about this one as a, as a home story is that you didn't get into a lot of that in homes. It wasn't about monsters. It wasn't about the supernatural or the living dead or, or a hound from hell or whatever. But, but Mike, you know, having, uh, knowing the, the novel as you do, how is the hound described? Is it, is it something that is supposed to, we're supposed to think it is because this is clearly a dog. I mean, no, it's, no, it, it, is, it is in, in the novel. It is, you don't know. It's they handle it just like uh, the films do, in that it's not till the very end that you realize this is simply a dog, a, a big mean dog, big mean hungry dog, along <laughs> with phosphorus. Yes, 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 that's right. I forgot about the phosphorus. Yes, that's in his mouth to, to make him even um, more um, scary. And that's yeah, glow. Yeah. Uh, I think most of the novel is a horror novel it becomes a suspense or thriller only at the end when you realize there is no supernatural element to this. Well, and then to think about it as far as the novel goes in the trajectory of the Sherlock Holmes stories, it came much later yes. in yeah. the run. So it's interesting that it wasn't something that they began, that it was an early story and then they went away to more detective fiction. You know, it seems like, you know, was Conan Doyle really running out of ideas and, 
or just kind of like evolving in a way. Well, he, he always to... played with the supernatural. I mean, he always he always wanted to believe, but was never able to. And I think that's what sh that may be what is going on uh, in the way he plotted this one. Yeah, the character had died. I mean, he'd killed his character yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> Basically had to bring him back to life by making this kind of a, a prequel to, you know, the those adventures was this this had happened beforehand. Like that was how he got around it. Um, but yes, I love the idea of this this dog being painted with phosphorus <laughs> so that it glows out. There's so much theatrics being performed for whomever might be out on the moors that night. It's like it's it's a really, you know, it's some amazing theater when you don't know there's an audience at all nobody's nobody's supposed to be out on the moors so what are you doing with this dog you know running around to maybe somebody can see it and well, don't forget the escape convict oh man well, well there's I, five plots going on <laughs> and the idea that you know they're basing it all on allegedly this attack that happened back in the 1700s or something like that but then again was there any other death before after that one, before this one, which right. like demonstrates a pattern. Yeah, that there's a curse at all. <laughs> the curse yeah, of, of one. The curse person. of one guy. Oh, yeah. Maybe he was really he was really mean. People remember that shit. But you know the other part of you know your word theatricality, Aaron, um, which Doug mentioned is this the insertion of the canard of Sherlock Holmes being in disguise mm -hmm. and which is not part of the story, but is, uh, you know, one of the Easter eggs that they kind of give you as, Oh, here's a little thing. And that moment is super fun. And I wonder, you know, how many people are fooled or were fooled that, yeah. or was it so obvious? Well, moment? and it's one of those, I was actually thinking about that because uh, <laughs> in, in a way it's a way to inject Holmes into a story that, uh, he's been absent from for so long, but it's it's so close up against where the reveal happens that it almost feels beside the point. I mean, it mm -hmm. would have been interesting to see that peddler show up earlier mm -hmm. so that Holmes has been there all along right in front of us. We just didn't know it. At that point, he just he just kind of shows up and then he's going to be revealed to be Holmes in about you know five minutes. Yeah, they handle it better than some others. Like I've I've watched a lot of Hound of the Baskervilles. <laughs> and in half of them, he like he's dressed and then just, he just takes it off. He doesn't even say anything to them at first. It's just like, right. oh, who's that shadow? Oh, it's me. Oh, I do want to go back to the dog because um, I hadn't I hadn't uh, seen this one in quite a while. I think the dog attack is really well done. I think it may be my favorite of of any of the versions I've seen because it's prolonged and it looks genuinely aggressive like uh, richard green yeah. or his stunt person they yeah. are falling off cliffs and they are being you know like rolled around they they get up they get thrown back down again i really dug it yeah. and then mike you talked about the ending being a little weak you're talking about the very ending or the return of stapleton he he runs away and oh there are policemen out there who will catch him right right, right yeah uh, yeah no no just no 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 we need somebody needs to shoot him or something uh, yeah but if we back up to the Stapleton scene with yeah. Henry Baskerville, I had forgotten about that. I don't think that's in the book. After the scene of the hound out on the moors, do we have that little kind of denouement where Stapleton returns, uh, where Watson is nursing Henry Baskerville, then Watson leaves him alone and he goes to poison him. This is genuinely, you know, suspenseful. Like I, That's I, just in, the, in that film. And I agree, it's pretty well done. No, Holmes showing up from the dead, supposedly, just at the right moment, knocking the glass out of his hand. Well, in in, in the book, uh, they go to arrest him and he's he's run. But there's no there's no poison bit. Not that way. Yeah, this was wholly invented for this. Yeah. Because film. that's that's where Lestrade pops up in the book. Right, who is notably absent here. Yeah. In in most versions. Yeah. And to Doug's point about the the censorship, if, I re if I'm remembering right from this version, the last moment, doesn't Holmes ask for the needle? Yes. Yes, he does. Yes. Which yes, I thought does. for 39, yeah. like, <laughs> you kept that in. <laughs> well, that was yeah. legal in 39. I mean, you know, well, mom could go to the drugstore and get some herself, so. But then it was it was edited out of many prints 
yeah, for totally many true. years. And I think it was only restored recently, like within the past 20 years or so. Cause that really popped up to me. I was like, Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> He's so happy. Watson's so happy to go inject him too. Like, <laughs> his face just lights up. Hey, he's a doctor. I mean. <laughs> so let's bump ahead to uh, our 1959 version, which uh, I was telling Dave backstage, having not gone back and read the source material or seen the 39 version in quite a while, I was surprised at how uh, not faithful to the novel it is. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's so much invention there. And this is Hammer. You know, um, they had just had the one-two punch of, uh, Curse of Frankenstein in 1957, and then Dracula in 58. Uh, Mummy would be following this. So this is kind of like the third big pairing of Cushing and Lee, Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. Since everybody kind of talked about their origin story with the uh, 1939 version, how did you come to the Hammer version for the first time? I would say that I hadn't watched it in detail until we uh, agreed to get together for this. And um, I, I mean, I'd seen bits of it and parts of it. And I think I was confusing it with the other times that Peter Cushing. Right. On the, to, on for television. the BBC. BBC or, yeah. Yeah. Different times like that. I, I think what, what struck me about it though, was that in this era of, of hammer navigating sort of the, the universal canon of, of films that it seemed as though this was part of that series in their mind. When yeah. in fact we know it wasn't because right. it started at 20th century Fox and then just kind of came over, even though, you know, they shared in the universal films, a lot of the soundtracks and certainly the sets and back lot, things like that. So it felt to me really like they were in the zone of going, we want to have blood and sex and violence. And that's what we're going to lay it on. And it doesn't matter whether it's Sherlock Holmes or Dracula, it's all of the same world. And that's what they succeeded at is that it's hugely violent. It's hugely bloody. And the thing that strikes me most is the take of Henry Baskerville as played by Christopher Lee, who seems to be almost more of an antagonist than the hero mm. as portrayed in the earlier film. Mike. I realized after the first five minutes that I had not seen this. I think it is one of the finest pairings of Lee and Cushing that they have on screen. They are, maybe I'm just, you know, overreacting for, you know, it, it being new to me. Sure. But boy, the, the great spikiness between those two, when they really were, were kind of going after each other uh, and such a different take on the, the character, particularly uh, Christopher Lee's uh, from the earlier version, uh, it just really knocked me out. And Lee just dominates this movie. <laughs> 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 Which is tough because you got Cushing and Cushing yeah. is really leaning into this and making, uh, making much as he did with Van Helsing, yeah. making him a much more action, uh, heroic type of character. Yeah. Uh, Doug, how about you? This was the first time I'd seen it too. And I, I watched it twice. I enjoyed it so much, even though it's so not faithful to the book in many ways, but it's a just classic uh, hammer of this era, as you said. And some of the changes are so out there the the daughter she's not the wife or the sister she's the daughter and a, a temptress and we get to see her drown in the moor and so melodramatic but kind of enjoyable dave two things i love are, are holmes and peter cushing so i saw this 12 maybe i just discovered hammer at the local video store and i devoured i've seen this movie so many times yeah this in, in Cushing's Frankenstein's just endless loop through my teen years. So, and well, I know we played it later on, but it seems so mm -hmm. interesting that they chose to cast Peter Cushing as Sherlock Holmes as opposed to Christopher Lee, who physically would have been an easier mm. match for mm. what your expectation is. I don't think you can look at it and not go, doesn't Sherlock seem a little short in comparison <laughs> to like well, your Cushing? of it but maybe it's just the two of them you know next to each other Cushing was a big part of it getting made he was a huge Doyle fan like wrote essays about it in his spare time yeah and I know that he made a lot of changes to the script uh, so that uh, it would be more in keeping with the spirit of the Doyle novel even if it wasn't necessarily following the letter of it. And we get to see props Peter in full flower because 
he's got he's got fire he's got <laughs> guns he's got knives i mean he is just working every piece of scenery that he can um but as you were pointing out mike that the dynamic between Lee and Cushing is really great, especially where he's uh, Cushing is deliberately, you know, goading him to yep. go to the Stapletons on his own. It's really fun to watch the antagonism and then to have Andre Morel, who we're going to talk about in a second because he's yeah. one of my favorite Watsons, uh, but have Andre Morel just going, why you didn't have to be so awful and, <laughs> and have Cushing go, don't you understand? Um, you use the word spiky kind of in terms yeah. of their relationship, but I think he is a wonderful spiky Holmes. He's not necessarily likable. I find uh, Rathbone, at least in the this encounter, he's he's a much more likable character yes. than Cushing's character. Cushing's character is so kind of arrogant and uh, just annoyed with people who can't keep up. Which is true to the, the literary Holmes, yes. too. Uh, Lee's aggressive Baskerville, you know, mm -hmm. and he walks in there and he's, you know, he's ready to take over and uh, sees this hot Spanish gallon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, you had, this is your first time seeing it. Uh, what were some things that kind of came up for you? Well, you know, one thing that uh, surprised me was that so many of the performances were played kind of bitterly. Um, Mortimer, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mortimer, he's not a likable character like he is in the 39 version. Um, actually, the, the Barrymores, as they're called here, are, are a little softer here. My favorite of those are the 39 version, John Carradine and Eileen Ma Malian, even though they're not like the ones in the book. Um, but the, the, and, and we already mentioned, uh, you know, Christopher Lee's uh, Sir Henry, they all seem like suspects. None of them see, and, and of course, uh, Stapleton himself is, is pretty edgy and not charming like he is in the book or the 39 version. <laughs> He's got a webbed hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like this version a lot and I like the changes from it. I, I love the hammer touches so much. Adding ritual sacrifice to Holmes, it, it should happen more often if you ask me. Because everything else has been done before. Let's, let's have more virgin sacrifices with Holmes. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the spider scene. I, I love how Lee plays it. I yeah, mean, yeah. I'd be, I was terrified because I'm an arachnophobic. <laughs> so like I was cowering and he's like, yeah, whatever. I love it. it it's, it's great. And I, I love how they use the more, they use the more better than almost any other version. It's, it's an active participant in what's going on. It, yeah. it affects things. It's not just right we're on a soundstage. We'll run fine. Or we're in Canada. We'll run fine. You know, the uh, character of the Moor, I think, is a good one to bring up. In the book, it's really kind of creepy. There's one point where Stapleton is talking with, I think it's with Dr. Watson. You know, yesterday there was a horse that was drowning. And, oh, look, there's another one. Oh, there it goes. And it's calling out. We, we don't see that in these films, but we do see people fall into it. Well, and I do love a movie that is a, isn't afraid to inject something new into a story. Uh, I mean, like the seance scene from the 39 version, right. you know, complete fabrication, but it it lends a quality of mystery and, and uh, more mm -hmm. of the supernatural that is not present. And I think, as you said, Michael, like, how can we make this more like a horror movie mm -hmm. um, with since it's not a horror story? Yeah, the old dark house. Let's talk about Andre Morel as yes. Watson. To me, he's one of the best Watsons I have ever seen. I mean, he really gets it right. He's smart. He's a doctor, regularly carries a pistol in his pocket and is ready to use it when necessary. Really, you know, carries the story in that long middle section when, when Holmes is out and ju just did a fantastic job. Like I say, this, this was the first time I'd seen it and I just thought, you know, this is the Watson I've been wanting to see on screen. <laughs> Well, he's obviously aware of, of what came before because it's very much not Nigel Bruce. And yeah. Very aware of that fact. And I, I appreciate it more for that. I'm always interested when you're, when you're seeing a film like this being made by the Brits in, in terms of a, a, a subject matter and a character that they have deep pride in and understanding of. And it's a strange comparison, but I think of the difference of like what happened to the character of Mary Poppins when Hollywood got their hands on it versus uh, what the Brits think mm -hmm. of Mary Poppins, which is a much also darker, mm -hmm. more almost sinister character, an unsettling character. 
Whereas in this one, I mean, to Doug's point, almost throughout, you don't know entirely who to trust. They don't, they're not giving you easy characters to go, oh, that's a person I can go to and I can feel comfort with. And I'm not sure if that's just an inherently British quality that when Hammer was making specifically this film wanted to make sure that they reinterpreted for the rest of the world. No, that was 20th Century Fox trying to tell you what we're about. That's not what this is about, you know? Um, I find yeah. it really interesting when you just go, this is what they think is important. And I well, think that kind of antagonism that you're talking about could almost be applied to all of the Hammer films. Yeah, I was, they, it, they were, uh, I mean, that was always Hammer's thing, was trying to do something that the Universal Monster Kids would love and know that wasn't a Universal film because they couldn't, you know, the Universal had their lawyers at the ready going, <laughs> don't steal any of our stuff. Don't do something. Don't do Frankenstein. Don't do. So again, them doing Hound of the Baskervilles, they're like, okay, well, we need to do something that's different. Even though it was 20th Century Fox, I think people identified it with kind of Universal monsters uh, as well. And it was the first time, as was the case with Dracula and uh, the mummy and Frankenstein, that it had been done in color. So we get that hammer feel. We get uh, we don't get as much flesh as uh, as we got in some of the other period pieces, but we definitely get you know the hammer blood is is in evidence. Bright red and bright <laughs> bright red and uh, quite a bloody ending for the Stapleton, uh, Mister Stapleton, uh, Ms. Stapleton just sinks quietly into the, <laughs> into the mud. <laughs> that's that's the most lifted part from this one. Uh, about half after this end with, with Stapleton getting mauled. It was kind of an interesting spin at that we don't have our phosphorus dog, but this dog is wearing a mask. Yes. Again, for the benefit of whomever might be out on the moors, uh, they might see this dog with a giant head. Um, I just, I love, I do. I just love that aspect of the story that we're putting on a show for an audience that may never, ever see it. Well, I, I appreciate that they do that because I've again I was laid up. I watched a lot of Hound of the Baskervilles, and there's a ton of them where they don't even they, they don't do the paint, they don't do a mask. It's just hey, look, there's a big dog. Maybe it's a wolf. No, may I read the box copy? Oh, please, please, yes. Mike sent this to me via email, and I'm like, yes. you must, this, you must uh, do a dramatic. This, this reading. is the DVD box copy for uh, the Hammer version. A fiendish evil lurks beneath the mist-shrouded cliffs of England's fabled moors. In the form of a hellish hound, it feeds upon the trembling flesh of the heirs of Baskerville Hall. But before this savage beast can sink its teeth into the newest lord of the manor, it must pit its vicious fangs against the searing intellect of the most powerful foe it has ever encountered, the incomparable Sherlock Holmes. Beautiful. I mean, and that, that is very much, you know, that's, it's a hammer horror, you know, like even if it's not a horror film, we're going to make it a horror film. I, I haven't read the novel. So I was really curious about the, the differences of like, what, what were, what were the irregularities? What were the new things? And, and when it comes to Sherlock Holmes, I'll usually go to the, the Jeremy Brett series because they, they no. try to keep it so no. much faithful to the literary adaption. Um, but for for Dave and and Mike and Doug and, and maybe even you, Aaron, who who have seen maybe more of the other versions, I know we're talking about these two. But is there a different film version that is actually like the best, in your opinion? Yeah, I watched. Uh, I happened to watch the Jeremy Brett version this week, I did too. And, and and it's very it's by far more faithful than all the others. I don't find it more entertaining, but it's certainly well acted. Mm. But it's. It, it hits the book in ways that the others don't. Was it done as, uh, you know, several episodes of the, the show or done it was as a 90 a minute episode? Okay. So a longer, you know, version. The one that Cushing did for the BBC in 68, that definitely incorporates a lot of elements from the novel, but it also <laughs> in, invents a few things as well. The no, wheels kind of that I've not that. seen in any, and Dave, having seen so many, maybe you know, I don't haven't seen any of the film versions that use uh, Dr. Watson's narration from the book. And I know narration oh. is a tough thing in film. 
Um, there's one or two. So a couple of the '80s ones do. Okay. There was a '84 uh, American TV movie that uses it. It's bad, but yeah, most of them skip that. I don't know if I could say there's a best version. There's some I, I like. I, I like Brett's version a lot. Uh, the Soviet version is excellent, which I was, I was telling Aaron off stage, the 1980s Soviet Sherlock Holmes is fantastic if you haven't seen it. I mean, I think these two, uh, Dave and I were saying, these two kind of, in terms of just sheer entertainment yeah. and uh, the spirit of the film or spirit of the book, I think uh, these two kind of nail it. Terrence Fisher uh, directing the Hammer one, he was the kind of the go-to guy for the gothics. And he does a really great job here uh, in terms of just straightforward storytelling, letting the actors do their thing. I love James Bernard's score. It is super hammer. Like yeah. it's, oh. it doesn't uh, do the same kind of themes um, that we would get you, we would become familiar with, with like Dracula and Frankenstein. But the, in terms of like the, that driving rising strings and the, the trumpets, that opening scene with Sir Hugo, where he chases down the maid and murders her like violently and then is attacked. Like that opening scene is incredible. And it really does kick the movie off in, in high gear. You know, you're in for another hammer horror. I love the Sir Hugo scene in this one. Yeah. I, most of them are just like, okay, it's just a dull dry retelling, but the book edges and the they really went in with the costumes and stuff. I I love the Sir Henry opening. Well, and it's interesting that they open with it. It's not packaged from the present of right. Mortimer telling the story. We're not in a huge hurry. Well, it's in the title, right? We're going to give you the Hound of the Baskervilles. Then we'll get to Mister Holmes. Yeah, I do also want to just mention. Uh, I think the performance. Uh, uh, Mike, our our saucy Spanish lass. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> play Cecily uh Marla Landy like I love her performance throughout I love all the colors she brings to it and her finale like that final scene of her revealing to Henry who she is mm -hmm. and <laughs> she's going to sit here and watch you die yeah and, and with that crazed smile on her face I, I I loved her in this this and I I all the way through, though, I kept thinking, you know, Henry, no, no matter how sexy she is, you don't want anything to do with this woman. <laughs> She's big trouble. Yeah. And her dad has a webbed hand. I mean, yeah. come on. It's just not, not, not safe. Not safe. Well, that's not, that's not a bad reveal. I mean, again, I watched a lot. There's, there's one where William Shatner plays Stapleton and Hugo. So, you know, like what? immediately. Oh, yeah. no. yes. Yes. Um, they were bad. talking about that uh, with the 39 version. That's Richard Green plays Hugo. But then the, the, then the portrait is uh, oh, the actor. Great. He puts Hugo. his hands up and yeah. uh, you get it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, that's another one that's just, there's so many different takes and I, I like both 39 and 59 there's one of my favorites for it because i mean you know you love shatner but <laughs> shatner in dual roles is just not when, what you want. when when was that one when did that one come that out? was that was the tv movie uh it, it may be 72 okay we're, we're going to mention ever so briefly the 1978 uh peter cook dudley moore version <laughs> <laughs> which is out there for you to consume internet should you so <laughs> choose but I made to. Oh, make <laughs> yourself <laughs> more than that. Don't, don't. And, and one thing, Aaron, you mentioned earlier, this is basically a gothic. I mean, yeah. it is about, you know, people in the big house at night, lights in the windows, getting yep. out onto the moors. Both of them, that, both of them. Yeah, both of them. And, and that is a specific kind of horror, suspense, thriller, however you want to categorize it. And it's a damn good one. Yeah. You know, another thing like that, Mike, it, it, in, when uh, Dr. Watson is at the house in both versions, he hears in the middle of the night a woman crying. We, you yes. know, later it's explained, but before it's explained, it's creepy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think we get it in the 39 version. Oh, do we not? Okay. I, we think we, we get it in the, I know we get it in the 68 Cushing. I know we get it in the uh, 59 version, but I don't think we get it in the 39. The other thing we don't get in the 39 version is any music. 
like all of the yeah. suspense mm. sequences in the back half of the movie, they're all done in silence. Mm. And I thought that was pretty <laughs> remarkable. Yeah, it's like you get some incidental music when they're in London, um, when, you know, when the handsome cab is going and you see the gun coming out. But once they get to the moors, everything is played dead silent. And it's really uh, eerie for its absence. It's times when you would imagine the, yeah. you know, the, the building suspenseful music. It, there isn't any. Yeah, very atypical for 39 by yeah. that point yeah. where, you know. If it were Warner Brothers, it would have been a lot of music <laughs> at that time. And if it was universal, you would have gotten uh, Swan Lake. At yeah. yep. <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, cool. Well, let's bring things back around. Uh, final thoughts on both films and, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I think it's it's interesting that it's a story that people keep coming back to. I also watched, you know, the uh, Benedict Cumberbatch version, which is modern and so different. We couldn't discuss it with these other films. It's so different. But it's a it's a story that keeps coming back, and I think we've hit on some of the reasons why the the mystery of of the the legend and what's the truth and who's the disguised killer and all that. So, so I think these two versions, as you said, are the most entertaining. Particularly the um, the later one, I would recommend to anybody who just wants a good entertaining movie. You know, sit down watch a, a good movie. Yes, it's a bit dated in some respects, but let, let's say your your average Turner Classic movie fan, a young Turner Classic movie fan who had never seen this movie, I think would have just a hell of a good time uh, sitting down and watching it. The 39 would be a little bit harder to, to get into just because of the, the things that are so dated. And as, as you mentioned, the, the lack of music and everything. But I think particularly the the Lee and Cushing version, I would recommend that to, to any young movie fan, horror fan or not. And I think it's a great introduction to Peter Cushing, like, yes. uh, just as an actor, which I would say, you know, most of his Hammer efforts are, you'd be like, who's that guy? I want to see more of him. But yep. I mean, like that moment when he like flings the dagger into the, the you know, <laughs> that's right up there with him, like running down this, the table and pulling the curtains down. It's just, it's just a wonderful, a dramatic uh, Cushing flair. Uh, Michael? I, I think that in, in the world of film, when you have actors who became long associated with a character, you know, Sean Connery with, you know, to watch Dr. No like this, to watch Basil Rathbone in his first foray in a character that dominated his career and watch him not maybe not even be the best, the most satisfying attempt at the character, but I just find it so rich and it makes you want to then go watch more and more and find the radio shows and find the playbills and find the TV versions and and the moments that he spoofed himself on variety shows and things like that in the 50s, you know, it's just really fun to watch somebody uh, at a moment in their career when they maybe didn't even realize how this one thing they're doing is going to completely dominate the next 30 years of their career. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. We just talked about uh, Nightmare on Elm Street mm -hmm. and it was uh, Robert Englund in his first go at Freddy Krueger where he hadn't figured it out yet. You were watching him kind of discover what this character is. And I felt that way with both Nigel Bruce and uh, Basil Rathbone, that it's not refined yet. It yeah. isn't just they can just yeah. wake up and do it in their sleep, as they would <laughs> in subsequent films. Watching an actor at their first go at a character and watching them kind of like figuring it out, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just found that really exciting. And, and I thought that's a, that's a great observation. Uh, Dave? I, I mostly agree with Mike. I, you should go see the 59 version if you haven't seen a Holmes or a Baskerville before and then work into the others, 39. But mostly kids at home, scare your friends to death more. <laughs> <laughs> Bring back the Baskerville effect. It, it's, it's been dropped since 2018. Y'all have been slacking. Bring back the basket. Because somebody out there's got a heart condition, and well, you know somebody with a weak ticker who is easily scared by Bloody Mary. So jump out of those bushes and, and put that mask on your dog. And <laughs> right, absolutely. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, great conversation, and looking forward to having you all on again very soon. 
And until next time, keep searching, keep exploring, and keep sharing the scare. <laughs>